problem, no they finish. Are you? It's better to find your way, so go. While I be like that, see you. Are you? Me no be fight, me no be tired. Hey, welcome back to my channel. This is Become Successful with your host, Yemi Hosha. On this episode, I bring to you another important personality in person of Wivon Shaka Shaka. Wivon Shaka Shaka was born in Dubsville, Soweto, South Africa on 18th March of 1965. She's an internationally recognized South African singer songwriter, actress, entrepreneur, humanitarian, and teacher. She's dubbed the Princess of Africa, a name she received after the 1990 tour. Shaka Shaka has been at the forefront of South African popular music for 27 years and has been popular in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Gabon, Syria, Leon, and Ivory Coast. Songs like I'm burning up. Thank you, Mr. DJ. I cry for freedom, motherland, and ever popular Okombote, African beer, and Swa Shaka Shaka's stardom. The song Okombote was featured in the opening scene of the 2004 movie Hotel Rwanda. Before we go into details, if you are new to this channel, kindly subscribe. And if you subscribe, smash the notification bell to get notified of new release. Now let's get into details of Vivon Shaka Shaka top 10 success tips. Incredible celebrity in South Africa. All these things, I mean, it's a lot of pressure on you, isn't it? It is. It is a lot of, it's lots of pressure because, you know, uh, growing up in Soweto, you know, during apartheid, and, you know, having a father who died when I was 11 and mom being a domestic worker, I must say, as a young child in Soweto, you never thought, you never saw the light at the end of the tunnel because you didn't know if you will wake up in the morning, your house will be bombed, you'll be shot or anything. And uh, living in, in, in town, because my mother worked as a domestic worker, uh, because the then government had taken the house from her because she was a single woman, so she was not allowed to have a own a home. So they took the house, which was our home from her because she was a single mother, and we lived with the white people in a small backyard room. And it was very difficult. But you know, as I grew up, at the back of my mind, I've always wanted to be somebody. I've always wanted to be something. I've always wanted to, to, to air my views. Even when my mother would take Louise and Vivian to school, this, this were the white children she worked for, I would fight and say, I want to go with Louise and David and, and to, uh, to school. And the madam you know, the woman my mother worked for, used to say, but Yvonne, you can't. And I would ask all these questions. Why not? Is it because I'm black? What, is it because my mother worked for you? Why don't you pay for my school fees? <laughs> and she used to call me a little rebel. And, you know, even today, I still see her, and uh, my children call, call her your, ma your white mother, mom. Every time she calls to say hello or ask things, my kids will say, mom, your white mom. So I know it's pet calling. But, you know, I've always wanted to ask questions. I've always wanted to know why is the color of my skin, sh it, why should it deter me from wanting me to be what I want to be, to live wherever I wanted, to go to school uh, w with white children. But, you know, apartheid, and that's it. Morning now. Tell me about your father, what you remember of him. You're only 11, as you said. I was 11 when my father died. All I know about my father was that he was a great singer. I think this is where I get the voice from. Uh, he loved singing. I know that Dad would play Mahalia Jackson, Aretha Franklin, and all those songs. And when he played Miriam and Hugh Masekela songs, he would shut the curtains, close the windows, and the volume would be very low. But you know, in the townships, everybody takes their music outside, and it's a competition. Who plays the loudest? And he would play the music so loud and he'll call all the three girls to come and sing and make all the noise. And he was a brilliant father. He cooked, he cleaned, he, he made sure that every Friday we eat fish and chips, you know. And for me, it will be with something else because I was a baby. So, I mean, really, for me, he, I could have married my father. He was a good man. I gather you used to play on little tin drums. Three girls and about 40 rand, just a few dollars a month. Oh, How yeah. did you survive? How did you manage that? I must say that everybody now asks me, 
who is your hero? Uh, who is your icon? I always say my mother was. Because when I grew up, my mother, I've seen these things happen. My mother protected us. Now that I'm a mother myself of four boys, I look at my mom and I say, I wish I could do so much for her. Mom protected us because we were three girls and her. So it's four women in this house without a brother, without a father. Any Tom, Dick and Harry would come and try to do, take advantage of us. But mom protected us with absolutely everything. She was there to make sure that we were not going to go and beg next door for food or we were not going to go and find a pita or a Ritz to make you feel good and give you a dollar, you know, because every girl wants to look good. Every girl wants an extra money. Every girl wants extra shoes or to look beautiful. But mum made sure. She used to say, I will sell my shoe to make sure that you girls have got absolutely everything. Mum would take her food from work and bring it home for us to eat. And for that, she's my hero. She protected us. She was there for us with the 40 rents, which is less than $5. She made sure that we had food, we'd gone to school, and we had been, we'd been clothed from that. And I look at her and I think, really, I'm the woman that I am today because of her. And the two... You got a bit of a break when you appeared on television. The first black child, a teenager on South African TV... Uh, Sugar Shack, talent show, 1981. Yes. Tell me about that experience and the impact it had on your life. You know, um, I must say that uh, Sugar Shack had um, a great impact in my life because uh, when a guy called Bernard Joffe uh, came to Soweto, a lady that I went to church with said to me, Yvonne, I know you, you like acting, you like singing, you like reading, you like doing all sorts of things. There's um, auditions. And I thought, what is an audition? I've never heard of that name. He said... Um, this woman insisted, says, I know this guy, I, I work for him or something like that, I can't even remember, but they'll be coming to Soweto, they're looking for young girls and boys who've got talent. And I thought, what's going to happen? What are they going to do with us? They're going to pay you, you're going to be on TV. And I thought, on TV? We don't have TV, you know, we, we, there's nothing. I mean, black TV, when it started in South Africa uh, in 1981, because we only had TV One, which started in 1976, it was just only white people. And so I thought, okay, I will go for the auditions. And I went in. It was hundreds of children. You know, long ago, things were done amazingly. You know, when people were advertising, they'll go with a loudspeaker and go, hello, hello, on the 12th, on the 13th, we'll be coming to Soweto. We need kids to... And, you know, we'll run after this car because everybody wants to hear what is happening. And it was amazing. The hall was packed. And the guy sat there. We saw cameras, we saw lights, and we were like, what is happening? Are we in a movie here? I mean, every child thought they wanted to do something. And Bernard Joffe, you know, just said, okay, those who can sing one side, those who can dance, all. and he, you know, separated us. And um, I guess I was very lucky because when the whole program started, I became the first one. And when I met Bernard Joffe and I asked him, he said to me, Yvonne, you came in, you had this smile on your face, and I don't know, this twinkle in your eye, you are not the most dressed girl. You, you were a little bit shabby, but neat, clean. You know, I mean, and I said, but remember, I was a poor man's daughter, man. And, and he said, but you just had all what it takes. And that's why when I thought we do the program, you would be the first one. And that really, for me, was amazing. But it did not do anything to me because we never had TV at home. There was no ways I could watch that. But he paid us lots of money. I managed to give, I was richer than my mother. Because we, I earned 500 rands, which is, um, I think, uh, uh, $100. $100. Yeah, that was a year's salary for my mom. And I gave the mother to my mom. And, I mean, she helped. It helped. It paid for my school fees, my sisters. It bought clothes. And uh, that was amazing. I had things that I never thought I would ever have. How, how did your mother feel in general about you singing? still studied very hard. You were very academic. You got two diplomas. You were uh, at the University of South Africa. You got one in uh, management, government administration, one before that in adult education. You studied speech and drama at Trinity College in London. You had quite an academic career. So I guess you were, I don't know, was it like a backup in case? You know, uh, my mother wanted me to be a lawyer. And when I started singing, she was not happy at all. And um, I've always wanted to be a chartered accountant because I loved counting. You know, I, I wanted to, I always made sure that my books balance. 
And um, when I started singing, I, I, I saw this whole fame coming, all this money coming. As a matter of fact, I built my mother her very first house, you know, big house, because we lived in the government houses. And I said to my mom, just to entice her and just say to her, I'm still your daughter. I'm not going to go astray and I'll be what you want me to be. Because she's always said, you know, I'm a domestic worker. I don't want you to end up like me. Your father died when uh, you were young. So I really want you to, to go to school and, and fend for yourselves and, and, and not depend on men or anybody. So, you know, mom, with, with what she wanted us to be and with very little education that she had and still aspired for us to be better people. So I thought, you know what, I don't have to, I have to make her happy. And, but it's not going to be for her. It's going to be for me. So for me, I thought I have to have something to fall back on. So I sang. I, I mean, I'm in love with the DJ. Within five days, it sold 25,000 copies. And money was coming. People were starting to recognize me. People were waving. People wanted autographs and things like that. But I just said, you know what goes up must come down. I then thought, I have to go to school. Well, not bad for a girl from Soweto, of course. To go to school. Well, not bad for a girl from Soweto, of course, performing in front of presidents and royalty and, and heads of state, but also collaborating with some fantastic global artists, other global artists like yourself, uh, Ali Lennox, Bono, Yusun Ndour, Angelique Kijo. And I wonder how much that has also enriched your music, hearing that, that kind of blend. You know, I think when, when I grew up, you've heard about Le any Lennox. You've heard about so many people, and you thought, I would never meet these people, the Miriam McEvers of this world. But, you know, when uh, my doors opened, when I started performing, because for me this is how I would, I would air my views, this is how I disseminated information out to the world and to the people. And when I met people like Annie Lennox, like Yusin Du, like Angelique Kijo, I mean, by the way, she's like a madcap. She's just <laughs> she's amazing. Yeah. You know, when I go with her in, 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 in Johannesburg and in Senton, and she's like, is this South Africa? Is this Africa? <laughs> you know, I mean, she's just an amazing, amazing lady. I really look up to her. Really, for me, it has made me a better person. It has made me understand other people's cultures and other people's music because, you know, for me, music, it's arts and culture. Uh, We're all different and yet so diverse, and yet we all speak in one voice, which is music. You know, it's amazing, Yvonne. You had such fantastic experiences. Have you managed to achieve what you wanted to through your role as a goodwill ambassador for the United Nations, Rollback Malaria and, and UNICEF? You know, the past six years working as UNICEF and Rollback goodwill, uh, goodwill Ambassador, Rollback Malaria Goodwill Ambassador, it's been a long walk to freedom, really. Uh, it, uh, I've seen faces and places. I've seen good and bad. You know, you go to other places where people are given these long-lasting nets, which they're supposed to be sleeping under them. They're taking them and going use them for fishing. Yeah. You see these women going to places and they go there, there's a shortage of medication and they say, we're not going to come back here because we've been walking for days and what, what happens? They end up dying at home. But with the education, the information and, and just communicating to these women, changing their mindsets, I really think it has, this, there's been so much impact, so much improvement and I've seen, I've seen change. I've seen women saying, you know Yvonne, you came here last time and now we're sleeping under the nets. We're educating other women here. Some of the women who are HIV positive, we make sure that they don't have malaria because they will die from that. Women who are HIV positive and living with TB, we make sure they get their medication. So really for me, I'm so fulfilled. I always say, you know, I know I've done a little and there's still more to be done, but I have changed people's lives. I've done what I could. And really, with the UN, with all the collaborate, uh, people who are collaborating, businesses, everybody, and governments, because nobody can do it on their own. We need to collaborate. We need to work together. But above all, I think it's important for our African governments to invest in their own people as well. And your boys are following you. They're following you down that musical path. To what degree are you also making sure they have these values instilled? How are you able to make them realize? I mean, they've, they've come from a much better situation than you were in. Oh, yeah. You know, my children really are very lucky because when um, they started schooling, they went to private schools. They, it's funny, they had uh, white Indian uh, colored friends. For, for them, color is not a problem. They, unlike us, who had the worst education. You know, I, I remember my son in Fumo, he was about five. 
he's very frightened of dogs. He had gone to visit his white friend, Mark. He'd been sleeping over there, and he, he really hates dogs. And he went to Mark's house, and little Mark, with little Mfumu, the dog comes, and Mfumu starts screaming, and Mark says, no, Mfumu, don't scream. The dog won't bite you. It bites only black people. Oh. So Mfumu looks at himself. He thinks, oh, am I black or am I not? So he comes home. He's so happy. Mom, Mark's dog didn't bite me. It only bites black people. I said, darling, you are black. <laughs> He said, no, but it didn't bite me. I said, but really, you are black. So um, it, it probably was happy to see you. And uh, so don't be frightened of dogs anymore. But you are black. And I want you to know that and respect that and be happy, you know, for who you are. But, you know, my children um, don't know color. They've grown up after we've had our freedom. And uh, to them, black, white, and yellow are the same. Because I think the, the, the grounds have been leathered for them by those people who really died for us to, to call South Africa home. You know, I always walk to all and say, I may be the citizen of the world, but first I am a proud South African because of people like Mandela, Oliver Tambo, um, uh, Steve Beagle, who really fought for us to have equal rights, to have e equal education, even though we didn't have, but our children. So uh, it makes me very proud because I call my country a rainbow nation, and it really is. You've seen so much, of course, you've seen... so much of course you've seen the, the downfall of the apartheid era you've achieved so much as a musician and so on what's left on yours i mean you have a busy schedule anyway but what's left in in the, the on that tick list of things you want to do you know as i said uh, i've really tried to help and close the gaps here and there there's still so much that needs to be done people as a south african i can say we fought apartheid and we were able to 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 transcend to transcend and 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 and, and be south africans all of us without very little bloodshed. Some people really died, you know. And, um, and, and now I look back and I think there's people who have to walk hours to go and get medication. There's still people who don't have safe, clean drinking water and sanitation, houses. Uh, there's people who still live in, in, in shacks. That is not acceptable in this day and age when the tools are there, when we are living in this whole global era you know, we need people to invest. We need donors to bring in the money. We need the recipient countries to say, we've got this money, use it correctly, use it appropriately, use it to the people who need it the most. So for me, really, it's, 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 it's just working with different people, those who want to make people's lives better. Because if we can help get our health and our education system, I think people, when people are healthy and when people are educated, really, then all countries, can then start saying, we've got it right. How would you like to be remembered? How would you like to be remembered, Yvonne? What would you like your legacy to be? Um, you know, I would love people to remember Yvonne just as a singer, you know, <laughs> because I, I love singing. It's through my music that I've managed to meet all these people, that I've managed to be in the platform that I am today. Because if it, I was just an ordinary Yvonne, Nobody would have known me. I would not have had an opportunity to do what I'm doing today. I would never had an opportunity to stand and talk to Ban Ki-moon and talk to President Mandela and still go down to those women and talk to them and bring their voices to the world. These women, for me, are the ones that make me want to live more, if I may. But really, I think my job is done. I think all I need now is to meet my creator and say thank you for the life. Yvonne, thank you so much for your time. What a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Come Successful with Yemi Hosha. What are those points and the hints that really resonate with you about the top 10 successes by uh, Yvonne Shaka Shaka? Um, I'd like to read your thoughts. Kindly let me know in the comment section. And if you enjoyed this episode, like this video, share with family and friends, and subscribe if you've never subscribed. And if you've subscribed, also smash the notification bell to get notified in case of any new release. And I will see you on the next episode. Peace. <laughs>